Hello, Oscillator Sync here. My love for the Digitone is by this point fairly well documented. It encapsulates for me almost every aspect of an electronic instrument that makes me happy. But I think the thing that constantly has me coming back and being delighted is the synthesis engine itself. There are layers of depth to the engine that invite you to explore and be playful, to find ways to twist it into new shapes in order to find new sounds. This was never more apparent to me than when I was putting together the patch pack I recently released, which focused on drum and percussion sounds. There were so many sound design techniques that crystallised in my mind, and lots of little tips and tricks that I learned that made the whole process so rewarding. And in this video I'd like to share a bunch of that learning with you, a load of tips, tricks and techniques that I'll always have in mind when I'm building drum or percussion patches on the Digitone. This is going to be a long one, so you'll find timing references in the video description if you prefer to skip around, but I hope either way that you can learn some useful tips for your own patches. If you do, then feel free to pop a like on the video and share it with similarly synth-obsessed friends, and if you have any tips of your own, feel free to share them with the community in the comments on this video. So given that the very nature of percussion sounds is it's one thing hitting against another thing, uh, the attack portion of the sound is something that we are going to talk about quite a lot during this video. So let's start by talking about the absolute simplest way to create attack in the sound. Here is a low tuned sine wave. There's no modulation going on at all. Nothing in the filter, it's just the sine wave. And if we want to generate an attack, all we need to do is turn the attack time on our amp envelope down. And by the very nature of how fast the attack envelope works, you'll get a, a, a click at the start of the note. I always think it sounds a bit like a, a low pass gate almost. It's worth noting that um, this clickiness is going to interact with, uh, on page two of SYN2, your um, phase reset here. If we turn this to anything other than all pretty much, uh, sorry, C is fine, all is okay, but off and any of the other ones, you'll hear that there is a click, but it's not consistent. It'll click sometimes and other times. And that's because the phase of the sine wave um, that is making up the operator is going to be uh, different for every single hit. Uh, and as a result, you'll get an inconsistent click and quite an aggressive click in some cases. So if you're looking to get a good deal of controllable attack from the amp envelope, make sure oops, that you are um, either on all phase reset or at the very least uh, carrier phase reset. So while we're on the amp envelope, we should probably talk about the general shape of the amp envelope for percussion sounds. Uh, naturally, um, when you hit a percussive thing, it's going to create a sound and it's going to die to nothing. There's no way to sustain a uh, percussive sound if you're trying to emulate something that exists in the real world, which you might not be. But uh, So generally speaking, for, for percussion sounds, you're going to want to have your sustain level down at zero. But that does raise the question, what are you going to do with the decay and release? So if you want to have a consistent uh, result, uh, make sure that your decay and your release are set to the same thing, and you'll have a consistent response no matter how the note is being played. But I would argue that it is quite interesting to set these two differently. And in particular, uh, the way I usually um, approach this is that I will set my decay a little bit shorter and my release a little bit longer. Uh, what this will have the effect of doing, if we set some of these notes to be um, different lengths, so if I make this one uh, a little bit longer, maybe more, even more than a step. This one will leave where it is. This one will make a bit shorter, and this one will make really, really short indeed. The notes that have a um, longer note length now decay quicker because while the note is being played, we're going to be dealing with the uh, decay portion, whereas when we stop playing the note, when we release the key, it's going to shift to our longer release. I like setting up this way because it kind of makes me feel like the difference between hitting a drum and leaving my hand on it as opposed to hitting a drum cleanly and releasing the, the, the skin of the drum, if, if, if indeed it is a drum, immediately. I think this is a really interesting way for you to very, very easily get a performance uh, aspect into the sound. 
So this next tip is kind of a meta tip because it explains a concept that we'll need for some of the other tips. And that is that our LFO on the digger tone can also act as an envelope. So an LFO, um, and I'll just um, put this over to uh, pitch because it's probably one of the easiest ones to hear. Um, if I turn up the depth, we can hear that we have an LFO effect in the, the uh, pitch there. And the LFO is characterized by the fact that it is cyclical. It's going um, looping round and round and round and round. However, if we go into the LFO page two, um, uh, at the end here, we have two trigger modes, one and half, which rather than uh, giving us a uh, cyclical modulation, gives us a journey that starts and then ends, which is what an envelope is essentially. Now, which one we choose, whether it's the um, half or the one, will depend on whether or not we are dealing with a bipolar or a unipolar um, shape. So we have a number of different wave shapes over here. Uh, there's triangle, there's sine, and you'll hear, I'll just slow them down so it's a little bit easier to hear, that in both of these cases, the pitch is going up, it's going down below where it started and then it's going back up again. And that's the same for almost all of the shapes. Except for the exponential shape here. And that's because that is the only uh, unipolar uh, shape that we have. Hello, Oscillator Sync from the future here. I just got something wrong there that I'd like to correct. Along with the exponential LFO shape, the ramp shape is also unipolar. However, you'll generally still want to use the half trigger mode for that one, as the first half of the waveform is the actual ramp, the second half just sits at zero. The ramp and half trigger was a great way to fake portamento in your patches before they added the portamento feature for real, and it's still great for doing fixed slides at the start of notes. Anyway, back to the tips. And then random at the end. So if you want to use the LFO as a, a traditional envelope, your triangle, your sign, they give you, um, uh, if we set the shape to half, kind of an attack decay with an even attack and decay. Square gives us a, an up and down kind of thing. Saw gives us quite a nice falling tone. Exponential, as we mentioned, we want that set to, um, uh, to to one rather than half. Ramp gives us a rise that ends in a particular place. And by changing the depth, we can change where it ends. And then we have random. In almost all cases for percussion sounds, we're probably looking for a kind of an, uh, an attack decay kind of shape. So we're either going to be using exponential with our mode on one or saw um, with our mode on half. I tend to use exponential. The one other thing that we need to um, highlight here is on page two of the LFO, you have this malt here. Now, uh, by default, when you load in uh, a patch, that's going to be related to the BPM. But if we're using this LFO as a sound design element that's going to do something particular to the tone of the sound. We don't want that to be changing as we change the tempo of the song. So generally speaking, if we are using our LFO as an envelope, we're going to want to switch to one of the uh, basic multipliers here. I think these are hard coded to be related to 120 BPM. Don't quote me on that, but I think that's right. Uh, but they won't change their characteristic as you change the tempo of the song, which obviously is going to be uh, pretty important if we're trying to define a sonic characteristic of the sound. Anyway, with that uh, concept out of the way, uh, we can get onto our next attack related tip, which I've strongly um, already hinted at, which is that we can use our LFOs to apply a pitch envelope to the sound. So if we just set our depth to uh, zero here and we just got our, our low pitched sine wave there. If we start to introduce pitch modulation, and it will be the balancing of the depth and the speed, which will give us 
feels. We might want to up the multiply here. And we can get a wide range of sounds, lowering the pitch, sorry, lowering the speed of the envelope will give us a more obvious bump as opposed to a click. We can keep it quite subtle, we don't need to do that much depth to get a meaningful attack here. We can go for bigger depths and get more laser gun sounds and as we bring the speed up the laser gun kind of disappears and we just get a nice thick click. We can get really zap if we want. And don't forget that if you have an LFO to spare you can layer these LFOs. So if we set this um, second one up to be um, the same but slower, also going to pitch, you can use one to give you the click and then the other one to give you the general pitch bend of the note and layer those two things together to give yourself a more fully formed complex sound. Okay, on to the next uh, attack tip, and this is a, an obvious one, but I would be remiss not to mention it given that this is indeed an FM synth, uh, and that is that we can create attack on our sound by introducing uh, frequency modulation. So uh, for this, obviously, we can adjust our ratios here, and I'll, I'll do that in a second. Uh, uh, on page one of Sin 2, obviously, this is where we're going to be setting the uh, level but it's worth noting that on page two, in order to do this in a sort of percussion way and that it decays naturally no matter what you're uh, doing with the note, you need to make sure that um, as by default, the envelope reset is on. Otherwise, um, it will only start to decay when the note is released, which is not generally what you're going to want um, here. So we can introduce some modulation set our uh, envelope and wherever we want it to be in terms of the tone of the sound and you'll tend to want to have your decay pretty low otherwise you'll start to hear an obvious modulation not so much when your level is low but as you bring the level up you'll start to hear that obvious FME decay there which is very nice for bass sounds for example but not necessarily for um, percussion and just as with our LFOs the balancing of how much attack and how fast it happens gives you a wide range of tonal options and of course how you have the ratios set related to each other is also going to make a massive change. I sometimes quite like having it quite high and then not too much of it. probably apply a filter maybe in this case you can introduce some feedback for some rasp many many different tonal options here very quickly gets kind of hand drum sounds. And so on. Many, many options here to explore. 
So one more place to go and search for attack would be in the filter envelope. So I've just engineered a slightly more um, harmonically rich sound, just so that it's more easy to hear. Uh, coming into the um, filter page, we can start to darken the sound off. Quite like the four pole. And then if we introduce attack, or rather envelope depth, sorry, and lower our decay time, especially with our attack up full. Don't want, really want anything but lowest attack here. Otherwise you get wumps. And really, like in the other cases, it's going to be the balancing of the decay and release times with your envelope depth in order to get different attack characteristics. And of course, this is going to be a separate issue to the amp envelope. Of course, all of these areas of creating a tap become really interesting when we start to layer them together. So um, we could get a bit of thump there with the filter. Accentuate a little bit more with the FM there. And then also introduce our two pitch envelopes here to give us some more, maybe brighten up the filter in general. We're layering up lots of different places for our attack to originate from. And this kind of leads me to, I think possibly we're coming full circle here a little bit, um, because this is a really important tip that I think is sometimes overlooked, and that is that on our amp envelope, because it is so snappy, can also because our amp envelope is so snappy, there's actually quite a wide range of attack times that, especially once you've laid up other sources of attack, you can go to where it will still sound percussive and attacky but not necessarily as clicky. So we've softened the amp attack there. It still sounds like it's got plenty of attack in it, but it's a little bit softer. Probably pushing it a little far there, but you know, anywhere up to about 15 there, we've got different flavours of attack that we can be playing with. And sometimes having that softer amp attack and the other elements of attack coming from other places, that's where all of the nuance and all of the fun See there we've got much more attack from our LFO now. And we can actually push the attack time quite high. For different flavours. Still attacky, 
but with a softer front end, almost like it's side-chained there. So for the last few tips, we've been using a kind of a kick drummy, Tommy kind of sound, certainly a tonal sound. Uh, so let's move to the other side of the spectrum for the next tip and look at uh, a method for generating noisy signals. Obviously noise is going to be very useful uh, for cymbal sounds and for snare sounds and for claps. A whole wide range of percussion sounds are going to need a noise element to them. So let's look at um, a couple of methods of getting to noise. So for the first step, we're going to generate noise via overmodulation of uh, a operator. So for this, the easiest way or the most economical way in terms of operators to achieve this is to have a algorithm where you have a, a carrier of some description and then an operator with feedback on it. So in the case of algorithm one, you'll probably want to do this with the X side of the output. Um, algorithm two, you'd maybe switch over to the Y side of the output, for example. So really straightforward and people are probably already uh, aware of this, but if you crank the feedback, well, if we just start with the initialized sound, if we crack the, crank the feedback and we go into uh, SYN2 and we just whack a bunch of modulation, And there we're going to get a noisy signal in there. Now the relationship between the operators is going to give us different flavors of uh, noise. But actually, generally the noise sounds kind of similar. It's the overtones which are changing here. So next tip, you'll notice that in pretty much every case here, you're still getting uh, an element of the fundamental uh, happening uh, inside the sound. So you've got a very obvious uh, tonal aspect to it. You can try and mitigate this a little bit by detuning the oscillators. But it doesn't really ever go away. So my advice for this next tip is if you're generating uh, noise with... Um, over modulation, I would suggest that your carrier you tune as low as possible. Now, that means you've got a big rumbly sound uh, sat underneath there. But that big rumbly sound is easier to get rid of than a high sound because, of course, we can go into page two of our filter page. And pretty much completely get rid of that fundamental. If we had a, a higher tuned carrier, that's going to be hanging out in the signal for much longer. You do still have an overtone there, and you can try and tune it using the fine tune. And you'll probably find some places where it feels a little less obvious. Like there, for example. So the other way that we can generate noise rather than using uh, FM is actually to make use of our LFO. Uh, so you're probably aware that in the LFO page, one of the wave shapes that we can use is random. And... Uh, a noise source is really just a very fast random source. So we want to make sure this is running as fast as possible. So I've got the multiply here set to 2K. I've got the speed turned up pretty high. And we've got our signal here. And we can try sending this to a couple of different places. Uh, at first, you know, we can try it with um, pitch, which works pretty well. Gets you this quite gnarly cool 8-bit vibe and it is kind of different as it goes uh, similarly if we send it to ratio all that's essentially a pitch change but in steps and again really cool gnarly sort of 8-bit vibes going on there that I really like 
you can try it with um, your um, modulation amount even. But I think you get too much of the um, fundamental still coming through there. Uh, similar kind of idea with the filter amount. If we, we can get quite a cool sort of crunchy noise in there, but again, the uh, fundamental is really sticking around in there in a way that kind of makes it sound like it's superimposed on top of the sound, so maybe not always that useful. Um, I think some of the... That's the filter again, but the bass. I think one of the really cool places to do it is in the drive. Again, you can kind of get the... Fundamental still in there, but I think it's more integrated, more interesting. So that could be a way of adding a noise into a sound that you already have elsewhere. Similarly, doing with pan, if you're listening in headphones, what we've actually achieved there is kind of a stereo noise signal with our main signal still going down the middle, which is really cool. Uh, and also just hitting it with the noise, similar sort of idea. I think the other thing to bear in mind is that we can do the same trick with our filter if we set our carrier nice and low, we could always filter out more of the signal down there. And also remember that changing the speed is going to change the tone of the noise in this case. Kind of crunchy particle noise down at the bottom there. Okay, so one more tip for noise right now. I've come back around to having a uh, uh, an over-modulated operator to get uh, my noise sound. I've set my carrier super low and filtered it off in page two of the filter. I've also set my modulator as high as possible so that my overtone is as high as possible. So it's kind of almost disappearing uh, altogether. So my final suggestion, if you are trying to make noisy sounds, do not underestimate the power of having some resonance on your filter in order to give that noise character and make it sound more real. So at the moment it sounds very, very digital. We can enhance the top end just by turning up the resonance. But as soon as we bring that down, immediately this noise seems to live in more of an acoustic space to my ears anyway. Try it with uh, high pass as well. That sounds like a China symbol to me. Kind of getting the resonance around a snare drum. And of course you could boost this with distortion as well to get it just slightly dirtier. If we compare that to how it sounded with no filter, sounds digital, immediately has some kind of acoustic space added to it, I guess, by the resonating frequencies at the cutoff. Okay, so we've had some tonal stuff, we've had some noisy stuff. Let's talk about one of the other uh, sort of elements of percussive sounds, which is uh, metal or metallic sounds. Now, obviously, as you're probably well aware, FM is great at doing metallic sounds, and we'll get to that 
in just a moment. But first I want to look at a method of getting uh, metallic sounds that was used on some of the early analog drum machines, which is just by using multiple detuned high-pitched oscillators, essentially. And we can do that on the digitone quite nicely. So if we want to do this with as many operators as possible, the best algorithm for it is seven because it gives you the output of um, A, C, and both Bs if you put your X, Y in the middle. So obviously at the moment, by default, they're all um, tuned in unison. If we um, tap SYN1, we can start detuning these operators. We don't want to necessarily form too much of an accord, but there we have a bunch of operators which are now detuned from each other. And if we start tuning them higher, we can get that kind of classic drum machine, uh, metal, sometimes sort of clave sound. And if we wanted to introduce a little bit more harmonics to the corset, we can just turn up our FM amounts just a little bit to get a bit more sparkle in there. Which is a cool sort of classic sound. And you can, of course, experiment with different offsets. I tend to find that having them sort of tuned in pairs or in threes where they're quite close so there we have um, these three all pretty close, and then another one tuned a bit higher. Feedback might be a bit much. And of course you can fine tune the sound with your XY mix. And of course, once you've set this up, you can also always uh, experiment with different algorithms. You know, that's one of the great things about the Digitone is we can just sort of go into different algorithms. That one's pretty cool, a bit purer because we've only got uh, three operators coming straight out there, but with some feedback. So we could add a little bit of nice ting at the top there. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Okay, so let's uh, talk about using FM to create metallic sounds. So I've come back down to what is essentially a almost an initialized pack, just, just with um, some amplitude set up here. And I'm going to switch over to the Y side, so we're listening to the two B operators here instead. Uh, and what I'm going to do is just bring up my level enough here so that we're hearing some modulation. So generally speaking, metallic sounds, uh, the reason that they sound metallic uh, in FM is that you are generating uh, inharmonic overtones. And the way that you generate inharmonic overtones is by having a non-integer uh, relationship between the, the two operators generally. There are some sweet spots that are also non-integer, but generally speaking, having a complex relationship between the two numbers on the modulated the modulator and the carrier. Uh, that's where you're going to find these kinds of metallic sounds. And actually, um, it doesn't have to be that far off to start generating metallic sounds. Um, the easiest way to get to inharmonic um, relationships is to use page two of the SYN1 page where you've got the fine tune here. You can try and do it with the um, uh, detune knob as well, but I find this gives you a little bit more control over what you're doing. And as soon as you start bringing in any sort of complex relationship, you'll start to get some metallic sounds. Yeah, FM is absolutely set up to do this kind of thing. Um, we probably want to experiment a little bit with um, the overall numbers here. So we might want to push our modulator um, a couple of octaves higher. And 
and we might want to fine tune how much we are sending in terms of modulation. As we go higher, we might want to try and push things a bit harder. Metal tuned higher is glass. There's a good rule of thumb for you. Now, of course, we might find that there's some lower um, sidebands being generated here that aren't useful to us, so never forget that you have page drawn filter and are able to actually take those out. And we might also want to just filter the top end as well. And again, like so many things in FM, we're thinking about balancing a couple of different parameters to find different flavors. So here's an interesting side tip when it comes to metallic sounds. If you take a metallic sound, and uh, generally speaking, if you lower the modulator level, a uh, uh, ratio rather, and then lower the modulation amount, that's where you'll find woody sounds. Which of course you could enhance by giving it some pitch envelope on your LFO if you wanted. Give it more attack, or soften it. So the next tip is to be aware that quite often percussion sounds are made up of two different elements. So if we think of a symbol, for example, we have a metallic element to it where the stick is hitting uh, the, the metal of the symbol, and then you have the noise, which is going to be fizzling away in there. So really what this tip is, is to not forget that you have the XY mix, which gives you access to do two different areas of sound. So for example, just come back around to having a bit of a metallic sound here. If we go over to the X side, which is the A into C, uh, we're already getting some metallic sounds in there because B is being modulated into um, C as well. But we can use this side to generate our noise again. So we can set our um, carrier down low and our uh, modulator up high, crank our feedback and bring up the level here. And we have noise over on this side here and now we can think about balancing those two elements of our sound the noise and uh, the metal we really do have two different patches here which we're kind of crossfading between it's also worth noting on the uh, metal side here that we can if we want have a little bit of decay which is going to change 
the feel of the sound over time, along with everything else. And we may even want to experiment with making the relationship between the two noisy operators less. linear. Let's get a more complex sound. You can even experiment with not over modulating it quite as much and we get a bit more of a metallic-y noise in there as well. And having the ability to cross fade between these two elements and of course we could be parameter locking these within our sequence as well. To get different vibes and different grooves. We'll come back to this uh, XY control. So for this next tip on the XY crossfader, I've set up a patch uh, on algorithm two, so two completely discrete uh, lanes. On the Y side, I've set up uh, some noise, and on the X side, I've set up um, like a little thunk sound uh, just by using uh, the pitch mod here. I've also filtered out some of the bottom end, might put a little bit of it back in actually. like that. So we have two very different elements to our sound here. But what I've kind of set up here is the two different elements in a snare drum. A snare drum, you've got the impact of the stick on the skin, which is actually basically a almost like a tom sound. And it's everything else in the drum, the metal um, uh, frame of the drum and also obviously the snares crucially which create that rattly noise on top of that uh, so actually what you do with a, with a snare drum is you really that very first impact is very much thud and then the rest of it is crackle at the end so what we can do in our lfo section is come back to this idea of using the lfo as uh, an envelope so we'll do that setup again so i'll just set the just put 16 for the moment, we'll make sure that our um, trigger mode is on one. And uh, we'll go with our exponential here again. And for our destination, we're going to send it to the mix. So what I want to do is flick all the way up to our thunk sound and then drop back down quickly to our rattle sound for the end of the sound. So if I set uh, my mix all the way over to Y and then have my depth negative, which will throw it back towards X. And we're going to want to fine tune the depth, the speed. So without any modulation, it's all noise. But we can bring those two things together to get thwack. And noise out the other end. We can also change the final mix as well. And of course, if we want to add a bit of character to this sound, which we should, as previously discussed, just adding some resonance gives our snare drum um, an acoustic space.
tune. And we can try different combinations in here as well. Bring in some attack from an alternate source. find all sorts of different flavors kind of snare sounds or by crossfading those two different elements of the snare sound. Accentuate some of the crackle with the drive there. This is more than one tip altogether, I guess. Okay, so let's swing around back to where we started and let's let's look at some more kick tips. And the first one is going to be along the same lines as we've just been looking at with our snares with the crossfade. And that is thinking about using the crossfade as a way of adding attack to the kick. So here I've got just a basic kick drum sound set up with um, the pitch mod happening as normal. Uh, that's on the X side. On the Y side, I've simply got a higher pitched uh oscillator there and we can use that crossfade uh, modulation to have that little tweak at the start of our kick sound to give it a little bit of character at the start so uh, I've already got it set up here the mix as my uh, destination I've set up the uh, one shot and the timing here and we can mixing the higher operator just at the start of our hit, which is kind of a, a different vibe to having the pitch bend because it's not really uh, a pitch bend happening here. It's it's just giving you a, a higher harmonic right at the top there. And again, it's tweaking the speed here and the depth. It's gonna give you different feels to your kick drum attack. But it's a nice variation on some of the other tricks to get to that sort of higher attack at the start of your kick sound. Okay, another tip for um, character in your kicks. I've moved over to algorithm one here, which is essentially giving me exactly the same feel as I have. I've still got my um, crossfade happening here. Uh, all that this has meant is that I'm able to uh, have feedback on my lower pitched um, side of my sound rather than swap everything around. So uh, the next uh, tip here is that having a bit of noise at the start of your kick drum can also sound pretty uh, badass as well. So I've cranked up the feedback here and um, if we come into here and start modulating, we're immediately going to start getting noise because of we're over modulating. And if we just want it to be like a little noisy punch at the start, we just shorten our decay here. The nice thing about having the noise implemented here is that on the way back from it being noise, we're also passing through that cool FM vibe. 
So we're getting noise, we're getting that FM vibe, and we're still getting that crossfade happening in our uh, mix LFO as well. We could also experiment with different tunings here. Quite that one ready. So next tip on the kick drum characters here, uh, we've got a pretty sort of strong meaty sound, but what if we wanted to give it more bottom end oomph? Well, we can move over to our filter section and the, the instinctual thing if we're thinking about low end is, okay, we want a low pass filter to, to give us more low end, but actually the more effective way of giving ourselves more bottom end is actually to make use of a high pass filter. This is a, an old synth trick, if you already know it, Apologies, but it's a goodie and I wanted to make sure I mentioned it. So obviously, if we turn our high pass all the way up, we're losing most of our bottom end. If our high pass is low down, we still get quite a lot of low end, but we're not boosting the low end at the moment. However, if we raise our resonance, that's going to give us a boost at the cutoff frequency. And as we... There's an example there. If you listen on good speakers or headphones, you'll hear that we are getting a big old thumpy boost. And we can go quite mad with this. And we can find other points where this will work nicely as well. So that's less bottom end there, but you've got really punchy thunk there which can be really useful in the right context as well you can kind of think about this as like tuning the body of the actual kick drum So let's take a moment to talk about long kicks. So I've taken the patch basically as it was. I've made the envelope longer, so it's a longer sound. I've also made it a bit duller just because it felt better. And if I hit play now, what you might be able to perceive if you're listening on good speakers is that we're kind of getting a buildup of sound the low end is sort of throbbing in and out in a quite inconsistent way uh, and low end is, is uh, tough enough to to deal with normally having it throb in and out with the kick drum is obviously going to be a problem so the reason this is happening is um, because at the moment if we come into our voice management here if you watch the lights at the top, which tell you which uh, voice is being used to play the kick drum, you'll see that it's actually cycling through all the voices. So that any one time, by, by about now, there's eight versions of this kick drum all happening at once. Uh, and that's not necessarily a, a useful thing. So in the most recent um, firmware update, one of the things that they introduced is the option to turn on voice reuse, which means that for the same note, um, if we turn this on and we hit play now, so first of all, um, listen with your ears uh, and notice that we're not getting that strange sort of throbbing building up and dying down, uh, but also watch the lights at the top. Uh, you'll see that for the same note being played, uh, the voice is being reused, so we're not getting a build up anymore. Immediately a much more manageable low end. But arguably, uh, this um, way of working doesn't go far enough. If we were to change uh, the notes of um, these kick drums, if we were doing tuned kick sounds, um, because they are different notes now, although when it loops back round, it's going to reuse the voice, it's still building up and you're getting those weird overtones happening, which are quite interesting in a way actually there's probably a place for that kind of sound but it, it, it's probably not what you want in most instances so um, if you're doing long tuned kicks 
probably what you will want to be doing is coming into the setup menu, so shift and trig. And this again is something that is uh, new now as you wanna go into play mode and you wanna switch that to mono. So this means, as would be the case on a traditional drum machine now, the kick drum is actually monophonic or indeed on a actual drum, <laughs> a real drum is monophonic as well. Um, so now even with different um, notes, we're getting different or rather one individual hit it's being reused each time the resonance that's building up here is probably just due to the low pass filter i suspect yeah so the low pass filter is picking out some different uh, harmonics So we are nearly there with getting that all sort of working right and, and feeling right with those tuned long kicks. But that shifting of the resonance where we've used our high pass filter to pick out the body of the drum is still actually causing a problem now that we are moving notes because some notes are going to naturally be more around the resonant frequency of that high pass filter. So to solve that, we want to once again come into the um, setup menu. What we're going to want to do is turn on our filter key track uh, to 100%, which means that our filter will now track um, with the notes that are playing. So hopefully when we hit play now, so that will have shifted the, the resonance um, probably up. So let's go back and find There we go. And you can hear now that we've got that ringing resonance, but it is an even ringing across all of our hits. Okay, so I want to talk around a few tips that relate to making your patches sort of more performal and alive. And that's really um, around what I think is probably an underutilized area of the um, sound design on the Digitone, which is coming in and looking at uh, the Velocity mod in particular for drums. So... Um, sort of sub tip before we get onto this if we are going to look at um, uh, dealing with velocity in our patches what I like to do is set up a really simple pattern and I'll set uh, a step with a very low velocity a medium low velocity uh, one with the default velocity of 100 uh, and then one at max velocity so what you'll notice here is that these are varying massively in volume now. And actually, if we're going to use velocity to change the timbre of the sound, we probably don't want this much volume variation in there, especially for percussion sounds. That first one is barely even there. So what I tend to do if I'm going to build a patch where I'm making use of velocity variations is I will come into the setup menu here and I'm going to go to velocity to vol, I'm going to change the curve. So at the moment it's linear and I will tend to try logarithmic. That usually works fine. And that's working for me here. Uh, but if not, you can turn it off altogether so that the velocity is making no difference to the volume at all. And that can be um, uh, viable as well. I like logarithmic because it gives you just a little bit at the lower end there. 
Okay, so I've set up my um, pattern here with the velocities across here. So what I want to do now is look at what uh, I want to vary. So for a sound like a kick drum, the main thing I'm going to be looking to vary is um, the attack of the sound. So I'm going to be looking for the elements within my patch which provide attack. And that's what I'm going to vary. So the first thing is obviously um, we can look at the actual attack envelope on the amp. And what I will do is I will come into the page and I will find what is my lowest point of attack. And because we've got other modulations in this patch, we can go quite low, so something like 26. Now that's really, really lacking in attack, but that's okay because that is going to be our absolute lowest point. So what I'll do now is I'll come into the setup menu, we'll go down to our velocity mod, and uh, along the top here I'm going to choose uh, amp attack time, and I had it um, set to minus 26. Oh, sorry, I had it set to 26. So what I'm going to do is set it so at the maximum mod, it will be at minus 26, which is where I started. So that would take off what I've added and take me back to zero for the maximum. So if we listen to the pattern now, not only are we getting a variation in velocity, now we're also getting a variation in the tone, or rather the attack transient. Okay, so let's go and look for another area of my patch, which is giving me attack. So um, good example there would be um, my uh, the noise that I'm sending by modulating um, that uh, operator there. So at the moment that's set to 41, so we can find the, mi the minimum point, which is probably zero. Yeah, I, mean, I think it's probably zero, right? So we went from 41, we could push it even higher, maybe say 50, down to zero. So we'll leave that at zero for a moment. We'll come into the setup menu, go back down to velocity mod. We're going to be looking at uh, the level of A, and we're going to set the modulation amount up to 50. So that's going from where it is at the baseline, which is zero. And then when we hit it absolutely hardest, we want it going up to 50. So now when we hit, so I'm being ridiculously anal here. Uh, when I hit play now, again, we'll have the difference in our attack envelope, but we're also going to be having the difference uh, in that sort of noisy part of the sound as well. So making our patch more performable, as we build our patterns with this patch, we could be using different velocities to give different grooves and feels. So uh, let's maybe look at one or two others. So uh, a good deal of the attack is coming from the change in the pitch. So it's at 28 uh, point, uh, well, we'll say just 28, that's fine. We probably still want a little bit. So if we say like eight and it's going up to 28, so that's a difference of 20. So we'll leave that at eight there. Again, we'll go into our setup, down into velocity mod. We're going to uh, go to LFO depth one, give it 20. And again, when we hit play now, we've got the amp attack, the noise and the LFO depth, all creating differences in our sound. Just for the sake of completeness, because we've got four slots, let's use them all. The final thing that's probably creating um, some uh, variation is this uh, mix envelope here. So that's going up to, we'll say 38. So we'll put that down to zero, I think it's our starting point, so we don't get any at all, uh, like that. And we can go back in here, velocity mod. That's gonna be LFO two depth. And we'll give it, what was it, 28, I think. And 
Another candidate, I guess, if we're thinking about hitting it hard, it might be our filter resonance, which has given us that big old low end bump. So that's at 75. Um, we could lower that down. Maybe not to zero. Say 35. So in our um, velocity mod here, we could change that to our filter resonance. Uh, filter resonance, which is there, give it 40, and then our harder ones are going to have more bottom end instead, which is quite cool as well. So another place we can think about our velocity mod in order to give our patches more life uh, is around uh, harmonic content instead. So I've got that uh, sort of hi-hat metallic cymbal sound that we had set up uh, previously. So we'll come into here and we'll do our um, velocity to vol back to uh, logarithmic so we're not getting such a massive drop off in volume as we modulate uh, the velocity. So um, let's think about what is giving this its harmonic content. So one thing that um, you would maybe see uh, with cymbals is that you get more noise the harder that you hit them. So in our um, patch here, at the moment we've got a mix which is at minus 20 between the noise there and the uh, to lock that somehow there we go uh, and the metallic sound so we might for example say the harder you hit it the more noise you get so we might leave that at zero and go down to say minus 30. so we'll say zero is our starting point we'll come into here we'll go down to velocity mod we're looking for sin mix and minus 30 for our amount. So the most modulation is going to be minus 30. We're starting at zero. And the harder we hit our symbol now, the more noise we get. So uh, where else are we getting our harmonic content for from? Well, the, the big important one probably is the modulation of the uh, metallic side, so that's the uh, B side here, which is currently at 87. Some really interesting points along there. So if we go from 80 up to say 92, Give that a go. So we're going to be adding on 12 to um, sin B level. That's pretty interesting. We could also maybe check out what's going on with the feedback here. So um, at the moment it's 102. See, that's really interesting because we can go metallic there. So if we go up by 42 or something, from 60, that might be cool. So we can give that a go. Feedback. Let's come past it, I think. Up by 40 something. And we're getting 
a really, really dynamic symbol patch now that we can really build these ideas into the groove with different velocities. So by using velocity to modulate the timbre of our sounds, we're able to really fine tune the, the feel of our grooves. And that's something I definitely advocate for, for working into your percussion patches. But kind of the flip side of this is that if we were thinking about uh, this being played by a real percussionist or drummer, there are going to be changes to the sound which are probably almost random certainly not under direct control of the player, you know, little variance is based on uh, where, say, a drum was struck, you know, how uh, a cymbal was hit. And and those really bring grooves to life as well. Uh, and so adding an element of randomness into our percussion patches, it can be really, really powerful. So the easiest way to do that is to make use of a spare LFO if you have one. So um, we want to have our waveform shape set to random, obviously if we think about randomness, um, but we uh, don't just want that randomness to be going at a constant rate constantly, uh, rather what we want to do is adjust that randomness on a per step basis. So we want to have the trig mode set to hold here. We can also crank the speed, not that it particularly matters actually, um, as long as it's faster than the beat. And then we can think of a, um, uh, something to modulate. So just coming back around to our hi-hatty metallic sound here, one thing that could be quite interesting here is actually to think about the attack, because if we go longer on the attack, it stops being such a uh, hi-hat and becomes kind of a shake sound. So So for this, we want to find the midpoint um, of our modulation because the random uh, LFO is bipolar. So uh, whatever depth we set it to, it will swing that much that way and that much uh, the other way as well. So um, I guess really zero is the minimum point. I think there at 30 is going to be the highest point. So we can put this at 15 and then make the depth of our LFO at 15 and make sure we also set the destination to the attack envelope, for example. Uh, envelope amp attack time, there we go. And now if we set uh, the beat going, so here we have the velocity that is uh, giving us a common grounding cycle, but then how it's articulated uh, through the amp has been randomized, which gives us a cool feel that is both controlled and random at the same time. Okay, so one last tip, and this one's a bit of a longer one, but it's one that um, I've seen people talk about uh, a fair number of times, so I did want to address it. And that is related uh, to making a clap sound, and in particular, uh, the key defining feature of a clap sound, which is its multi-attack envelope. So let's just start by creating some noise for our clap to be based on. So we'll use the standard uh, frequency modulation over modulation recipe. So I'll set my uh, carrier down very low, I will set my uh, modulator here very high, I'll turn my frequency up, uh, feedback sorry, up high and I will create some noise that way. We can filter out the fundamental, maybe some of the harshness at the top as well, and then we'll use our other filter to add some resonance and character. a little bit off the there we go there's some noise there we'll put a standard kind of um, amp envelope on there 
And what we have at the moment is a sort of semi-passable clappy snare. Okay, so we don't have that big thwack uh, for the snare sound. So it's kind of like a clappy, snarey hybrid. Not one nor the other, really. So what we need to think about is how we can generate the um, particular characteristic characteristic of the clap, which is that multi-attack. The idea on most clap sounds that you hear are on drum machines is that it's not just one person clapping, it's multiple people clapping in a room, which is why you get that sort of clack a clap sound happening. And that's actually what uh, we perceive, especially in electronic music, as a clap sound. It's not one person clapping, it's a room full of people clapping. So we need to go from one attack to multiple attacks. So how are we going to manage that? Now for this, we're going to head over to our LFO. Um, so I will, we don't want these set to BPM multipliers uh, because we don't want it to be related to the tempo necessarily. And what we're going to do is have something modulate the amp volume which is the same thing that our envelope is modulating as well. And we don't want it to be a fading out kind of sound. What we want instead is this to be an envelope which is going to uh, have a hard attack. So I'm going to go with the exponential envelope here. We can't hear it at the moment because it is unipolar, but if we turn down the volume, We don't have to go all the way to zero, but we can fine tune this. You can hear now, turn the depth off. We have uh, multiple attacks there. Now what we want to do is speed them up. So Now the problem we're having right now is that it is going on and on and on and on. And that isn't really what we um, want. Um, now, if we were to set our mode to just once, we're only gonna get one attack, so that isn't gonna be right either. Instead, what we'll do is we'll make use of the fade control, which is going to fade out the modulation over time, essentially giving us an envelope on our modulation. Now, if I turn this to fade out, what you'll find is that past a, per a particular point, it's going to stop doing anything, which will probably weird you out the first time it happens. Uh, and there's a good reason for this, although I don't necessarily agree with the reason. Um, at the moment, our mode is on free running, and once we've faded out our free running and uh, LFO to a particular point, it's going to stop modulating at all. However, if we switch this over to the trig mode, now it's going to uh, restart the LFO every single time. This has the extra bonus uh, effect of making sure that we have a attacky clap at the start of every single um, trig. Now we can fine tune our fade and we'll find a sweet spot probably where we have a nice multi-attack envelope there. And the nice thing is here, if we do bring up our overall volume on this uh, patch, it almost sounds like reverb, which is a trick again that, that drum machines would use. And now of course we can fine tune our speed. We can have it more loose. Which is quite cool. We can go faster. And you'll want to, depending on the, the speed here, you'll probably want to fine tune the feed, the fade out as well. And there'll be lots of sweet spots in here where that works. And if you're feeling particularly fruity, you could, of course, actually use a random LFO step by step on the um, speed of LFO one, just a little bit.
to give it some variation as well. And of course you could go on to fine tune the fine tune the filter. We could put a bit of the fundamental back in there to give it a bit more of a thwacky attack. Maybe some drive. so on. Anyway, I hope that was interesting, useful, and if you made it to the end, well, wow, look at you. Well done. Um, I've just looked at the total running time of the recordings I've done, and although there's going to be significant editing to do, boy, is this a long video. So thank you for joining me if you've made it to the end. If you found the video useful and maybe learned something new, a new tip for you to apply in your music, please do give the video a like and make sure you're subscribed to the channel. And I'm 100% certain that I've missed out some useful tips. Uh, you know, it's inevitable. Uh, so if there's a tip that uh, you particularly like that you'd like to share with the, with the community, I will have a pinned comment in the comment section uh, for you to add to. Uh, and hopefully this video can uh, be a useful resource even beyond the video itself for people looking for tips for drum synthesis on the Digitone and beyond. As always, I'm so grateful that you could join me here today. Until next time, take care, and I will see you again soon.